I'm with Ilana Heidemann from the Israel Forever Foundation. Now, Israel experienced a terrible terror attack on the 7th of October. What were your thoughts when you heard of the news? Absolute shock, fear, and uh, anxiety, not knowing if this was something that was uh, real. What we were right away seeing, these images on social media of the infiltrations, and it was overwhelming. It was just the beginning. Now, about 240 hostages have been taken into Gaza. We've seen some hostages released. How did you feel when you saw them being released? Every question is like a, almost like another punch in the gut because there are so many parts of this experience that it, the release already happened weeks later. So by the time the release happened, we knew names and faces and we knew the stories of their families and we knew what they witnessed before being abducted. And so the release was incredible joy, but also pain for those families. And, you know, those families whose members didn't yet come back, you feel torn. On one hand, you want to celebrate the return of our captives for which we pray every day. And on the other, we want to be sensitive to those whose families are not back and the soldiers' families who are also waiting for their freedom and return from the fight. So it's, it's really joyous and you're happy, but you also, I have to add, see the faces and you know that they have been through this horrendous torture. You can see it even in the moments of the passing of the hostages over to Israel, to the Red Cross. You can see the apathy of the Red Cross volunteers. So that also arouses another way that you feel watching these hostages be the release, the lack of humanization, how Hamas feels that they can negotiate with life and they can play with people's emotions and how they use it as a way to further terrorize the Jewish nation who loves life in so many ways. So it, it's really a, a torture at the same time as being a joyous moment to see our hostages come home. There's no real right or wrong answer to this question, but do you think it was right to pause the war to allow the hostages to come out? And do you think it was right also to negotiate and allow Palestinian prisoners to come out as well? In the past, we have exchanged a thousand prisoners for one life, one of whom has manufactured the October 7th massacre. So we know the price that gets paid by releasing terrorists. I believe that the deal with the devil that had to be made and actually being mediated by the devil with Qatar being involved in the mediation, Egypt doing what they could. I think that Israel ends up in every situation in a no-win, no-win scenario. I believe that the terrorists that will have gone free probably will just continue to return to terror. Their families will have received significant funds. And I think that uh, there's no way for us to judge the decisions of the leaders who are put in these awful positions when international organizations stand by, do not help, do not aid Israel's justice in these scenarios. Uh, do you think they will get all the hostages back? I can only pray that they will. Do I think that we will procure at least the bodies, we know that many have already been executed. Will we procure the bodies later on? You know, that's always a determination. But then again, we get deterred by wars that keep coming at us. And you asked before if I was, um, if I agree that we should have, was the pause worthy? You know, Israel right now is in a position where we have to show our strength and our willingness to stand up for justice and freedom of the Jewish state. And the pause was a way of demonstrating the immense values on which Israel stands, however religious you are and whatever religion you are. So I think the pause was necessary. Do I think that the return to war was necessary? Absolutely. To remind them that the pause was a gift and we're going to get the rest of our hostages back no matter what. Whether or not Hamas and their local civilian supporters are going to take our people's lives into their own hands, we can't know. We know nothing about the Bibas family. It makes no sense that international organizations and child welfare organizations and every movement in the world is not doing anything or saying anything that there are still women and children being held captive. And, and we already know the kinds of torture that they've been through. It is something that is beyond, beyond imagination. Do you think Israel will have to pay more to get the soldiers back? 
I'm sure at the end of the day that's a possibility, but I can't predict. I don't know. I just know that there should be, with the goal of not destroying the Gaza people, but destroying Gaza so that the underneath cities of terror can be totally wiped out and therefore Gaza can be maybe rebuilt with a vision and a life of hope and no hate against Jews, maybe what will happen is we'll be able to get our soldiers back, but the price won't necessarily be freeing terrorists. It will, unfortunately, be the life of other soldiers. We see our soldiers falling every day, and we know that they are fighting one of the ugliest and most immoral enemies that has existed in many, many generations of human life. Can we believe the numbers that we're hearing of the Palestinians that are being killed? Not even one of them. And, and is Israel committing genocide in Gaza? Not even one of those numbers can be accepted as accurate. Not even one single detail that is proposed as fact can be accepted by the pro-Palestinian Hamas supporting genocide attempt against Israel as the Jewish state and the Jewish people around the world. The calls for the death of Jews are real. The most important way to fight them is for people who are not Jewish, who are supporters of human rights for the world's most ancient people, that we should be able to band together and drown out the voices that are supporting this type of terror and hate. So every single number that is released, every video that is released, it is manufactured in order to arouse empathy for the civilians, but the problem is, is that there are none. There are very few, at least, we should say, where they are just pure civilians. You know, we don't like to compare the current situation to the Holocaust, but if you look at a thousand years of anti-Semitic activity, we see that it is civilians who often take things into their own hands. We know that one of the hostages ran and then was actually captured by civilians. We know that civilian children went in and tortured and beat the Jewish hostage children. We know that the Hamas drugged the hostages when they were being released so that they would look happy. And we know that everything is manufactured in order to make other people ignite the spark inside of them of, oh, yeah, it makes sense because, you know, the Jews are awful. And at the end of the day, nothing about Hamas can be believed because it is all about the destruction of the Jewish people. The biblical story happening in our time is being manufactured through social media and lies and fabricated numbers and fabricated information. And the only way to stop it is if common people get involved. How has the Israel Forever Foundation been working during this time of war? We have been involved in literally every possible stream of engagement. Not only have we raised funds for tactical needs of a few army units, we have also provided community security in a few communities throughout the country. We have done a uh, campaign which was Al Ha'esh Mitachat Esh, on the fire, under the fire, for the displaced families to be able to receive a Kabbalat Shabbat barbecue, lifting their spirits. We have even for Hanukkah with Maccabi World Union a candle lighting where we'll be running a healing arts activity with uh, two communities that have been displaced to Kfar Maccabi. We have been collecting letters of friendship and healing arts where people can put not only into words but also into artistic expression and we get them from all ages. It's truly a special way to to see how many people are standing with Israel. But we also are providing a lot of content. We're providing resources to help people cope with the emotions that they are dealing with, trying to fight the hate, giving information, and giving resources for families, because that's really where it's going to begin. If we want to move after October 7th, and that's really the idea, right? The world before and after October 7th. And now, if families are able to feel empowered and they have a resource in their hand to do with their kids, with their family, with their grandparents, to talk about issues that kind of give us the foundation for strength and hope, because it's really hard to have hope right now. Mm -hmm. And I will say that Israel Forever, like many small grassroots organizations, you know, we are living in Israel, so therefore also struggling emotionally. And it's not an easy thing to try and take on living inside the war going on in Israel and coping with the war against us taking place all over the world. And that 
That's the dilemma that we face. We live in both of those worlds. The diaspora Jews are in a new war. They weren't attacked on October 7th physically, but the war ha exists all over the world. Are some of these people from the, the Gaza border communities, are they going to want to go back yes. to Gaza again? Yes. You know, already you have some kibbutzim where people have gone back. And they are trying to build a sense of restart community, a feeling of where is my home? You know, this is my home, this place is my home, even if my physical home has been firebombed. And I've witnessed all that I've witnessed. But yes, they're going to go back, and I'll tell you, I bet that they will be twice the size someday. Now, interestingly enough, we also know that many of the people in the communities, they were so close with others living on the Gazan side that there's, you know, also emotions that are there, that feeling of violation. Do I go back? Will my relationships return? You know, there's a conflict that's going on for some of those people in terms of how they relate to not only the massacre, but what's happening in Gaza. And that's really a test of a human empathy that we have. Many of them, if they go back, they'll have lost loved ones there. Yeah, well, they've lost loved ones there. They've, you have many orphaned children, and they will probably go to stay with family, maybe outside, but I imagine in decades to come, you will continue to see the emphasis and connection with these kibbutzim. I think there's a great potential to actually learn about the values of a kibbutz and why the violation that Hamas committed was not just sexual and it wasn't just political, it was also a violation of human values. This gorgeous life that, of peace and agriculture and communality amongst, the, amongst their neighbors, it's a, truly a violation of everything we hold sacred. Tell us about SOS Mum. Oh, well, as a mom <laughs> myself, SOS Mom became a, a component of our programming that we provided to moms who wanted to sustain their spirit and lift their lives as Jewish moms in the home. And it was launched actually just this past summer, and then here we are under war with a lot of Jewish moms suffering, a unique style of what it is to survive as a Jew today. So both Jews, Jewish moms in the diaspora, and Jewish moms in Israel. So SOS Mom is our effort to try and give them a little bit of empowerment and strength through the collectivity that we share as moms. It's not easy. The kids are coping in very different ways, each of them. There's a lot of obsession with wanting to know more, but the other is where they don't want to know anything, where they don't want to talk about it. So parents are finding themselves in, and, and teachers as well, are finding themselves in a unique situation of how much do we discuss? How do I as a mom cope with the fact that my kids are back in school? They're trying to give them a sense of routine. So the war isn't really a part of it because the bombs aren't falling on us as often anymore. Right? We hear them in the mountains where we live, but they're not falling on us anymore. So they're allowed to get back into some semblance of reality. But the parents, the moms, we still have to cope with the emotionalism of more hostages still there, more soldiers still being in, in the field. We have to cope with all of that. And so SOS Mom is just a way that we can, you know, one post at a time, try to make a difference and give people a little strength. It must be very difficult for mothers and for fathers as well to see their sons go off to war yes. at this particular time. You know, nobody asked for this war. Suddenly it's been brought upon you and we were in sort of a I wouldn't say a peaceful time, but then suddenly you've been thrust into a war and some of them will be fighting in Gaza and some of them won't come back. In my Moshav, we have many families where two or three of their children are serving at the same time because of the wide number of reservists. You also have some of the fathers being not at home for many days at a time. And you feel that amongst the society, it is everywhere. Everywhere you go, there are less men. But also the younger soldiers are not wandering around as often we've seen because they have all been activated and on different bases preparing and working on how to make this a successful war to its end. So the parents feel that there is certainly a purpose, a unified purpose. I think there's a lot of unity amongst the population of Israel. Certainly the political divisions exist, but everyone is trying to, while our sons and daughters are in battle, everyone is trying to overcome that to a certain extent. It's also out of comfort for the, every family knows somebody 
who's fallen. Every family is connected because all of their children are serving. And I can say as an Olas, an American who has moved to Israel, and my kids are here, but I don't have any soldiers in my family. So my friends' kids become like the people that we pray for. And I think that that's something also throughout the diaspora world. Other ways that we can make a difference is not only to pray for our soldiers, but to pray for the strength of our soldiers' families. We actually have a project even with, um, for Hanukkah, you know, we often feature organizations that are deserving of shining a light on them and the incredible work they're doing here in Israel. And one of them is an organization about girlfriends of the IDF. Because you never think about it. If they're just a girlfriend, they aren't even notified if the soldier falls. There's nothing. There's no connection. So this organization provides aid to girlfriends of the IDF. And then there's the others who are, you know, newly many, many soldiers are getting married. They're coming off of base, getting married, turning around and going on to base. And you think about why. What is that Jewish love of life that, that this is what we're doing, that this is how we are saying we are going to overcome the fear even of being a parent of a soldier and say, we are going to believe, we're going to keep our hope, we are not Jews with trembling knees and we're going to fight this until the end and hopefully this generation's enemy might be able to disappear. What do you think should happen to Gaza next once all this is over? Oh. Well, that's, uh, you know, always a loaded question to answer, but I do believe that there needs to be a security buffer between whatever is created. I personally believe that it would be amazing if Israel and other nations invested in a future for these people who have really developed their identity as a Palestinian to be able to either move into a area with, so that it's not divided, between in Samaria along the Jordanian border where they can be with families because there's always been an issue of questioning the divide of families. But I also think that it could be a place where terror and education could be rooted out with the right education efforts. So take it away from the power of UNRWA and all of these organizations who are terror supporting organizations under the auspices of their Jew hatred if we reform the education, we have the ability to revive a civilization that actually has respect for and understands not only the Jews, but also Israel's justice. Why was Gaza destroyed? How have we helped make it a potential new world? How can Egypt be a part of it? How can Jordan be a part of it? They have wanted peace with Israel. They had made peace with Israel. And you know what? These people can make peace with Israel as well, and they can stop calling for our destruction. They can stop trying to strip us of our history in Jerusalem and all throughout our ancient homeland. What's your prayer finally for the situation at the moment? My prayer is that our friends around the world join us in the Jewish fight for freedom, justice, and Jewish human rights. My prayer is that we will not stop this war until we have rooted out the underground city of terror that exists and perhaps uncovered all of their sleeper cells that I do believe exist around the world. I do not believe the war we're fighting right now is a war of Israel and Gaza. This is a war of the world. And if the world does not wake up, this will be happening everywhere again and again. It is not going to be easy to stop the wave of hate and thirst for blood that is now moving through the streets of London, of every major city in the world, everywhere. And the people who aren't chanting in the streets, they're in their homes and they're on their social media. And there's no way we can counter this. There cannot be a quashing of this thirst for blood because it is the Jew and it is every generation. This happens again and again. And if this is not somehow a movement started globally to stop the rise of this hateful caliphate, it will take over. What's your website for people who'd like to know more about the work that you're doing? Israelforever.org. This is uh, Israel Forever Foundation. We are an organization that emphasizes Jewish identity and peoplehood empowerment. And we welcome our friends all over the world to come and understand Israel's history, Jewish history, Jewish identity, and everything that goes into how we can fight this fight 
by understanding how the lies aren't about just today, they aren't about Israel, but they're rooted in a misunderstanding and a disrespect of the Jew. So don't let the Jew be dehumanized anymore, and Israel Forever is a great place you can come. We actually have a global community of virtual citizens of Israel. And over the years, we've grown to uh, many tens of thousands. And recently, with our uh, friends at the Friends of Zion Museum, we launched a VCI pilgrim so that this community would be able to re uh, request specific content that is related to how Christians in the world might want to utilize Israel Forever's resources. And I am available to speak to groups and I provide educational activities and programs and things like that. So we're trying to get everyone in the world who is not only a member of the Jewish nation and therefore a virtual citizen of Israel, but also those who are luckily and blessedly our friends around the world. Okay, Ilana, thank you very much. Thank you so much.